Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining the Lake Superior Health Insight Sharing Webinar. Your host for today, Joan Gallegos, will begin. Good morning, everyone, for folks on Mountain Time and Pacific Time, and good early afternoon for those on Central and Eastern Time. Uh, we're really honored to be doing this webinar with Lake Superior Quality Innovation Network. And the title of our uh, webinar and sharing call today is Reducing Readmission Rates in Inpatient Psychiatric Facilities. And uh, for folks that may have missed this, we had um, our first webinar in this series uh, two weeks ago today. And uh, that was presented by Lake Superior, John Glover and really highlighted uh, the bridge models and the RAD or re-engineering um, discharge models. So um, I would encourage folks um, to look at uh, the slides from that webinar if you're interested in that. Those are some of the best practices um, highlighted from the Lake Superior region. And I'd like to briefly introduce myself today. Um, I'm Joan Gallegos. I work for Health Insight. I'm a social worker and a registered nurse uh, with background in behavioral health. And I've worked for uh, Health Insight for five years and um, just really have an affinity for the mentally ill. And uh, I manage the uh, behavioral health contract for Health Insight. And my colleague, who I'm delighted to have with me today, or my co-partner in crime, Linda and I go back a long way. She's uh, she's a great nurse. And Linda, would you mind introducing yourself briefly? Oh, I'd be happy to. Unlike Joan, my background is not in behavioral health primarily. I've worked in hospitals virtually my whole career, and my clinical specialty is more critical care. But um, my responsibilities here at Health Insight are around the hospital quality reporting, which is how I got tied in because of the quality measures being used for inpatient psychiatric facilities. So put up with me if I'm not quite terminology correct, but um, I think this is a really exciting opportunity to talk about some different ways that we can help reduce free admissions in this vulnerable person, vulnerable population. Thank you, Linda. And um, we're going to get started right now. Perfect. Thank you. Um, the first slide um, basically shows uh, the geographic areas uh, that uh, Health Insight and Lake Superior Queen cover. We're pleased to report that we have some uh, listeners to this uh, webinar sharing call that are outside the region, so we'd like to welcome you folks. Quickly, Lake Superior Quinn, their region, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. And Health Insight, um, previously to about Four months ago, we were just in New Mexico, Utah, Nevada, and Oregon. Um, we recently merged with Paula's Health, and um, effective now, um, our reach is in Washington and Idaho, so we have six states. And quickly, our objectives for today, uh, we're going to have a a series of uh, kind of uh, slides that we're going to go over, but we want to dedicate the bulk of the time uh, to discussion and sharing. Um, but here, here are some slides that we're going to go over, and the objectives really for the whole session is to learn um, about the readmit tool. And this tool is designed to identify really psychiatric patients most at risk for uh, readmission. And uh, we're really pleased to say that Lake Superior Quinn actually developed a, kind of an a online tool that uh, folks can uh, use that makes it very easy to assess the risk. So kudos to um, Ross and John for doing that from Lake Superior. We're also going to discuss um, some pre-admission diversion interventions at the emergency department level. Um, we are really showing some success at that in our in our Utah uh, region. 
um, with reducing ITF readmissions. And then finally, we're going to um, let folks share information and answer questions and just discuss with other ITF staff in the upper Midwest and the Rocky Mountain Western region. So, a brief overview, brief overview on care transitions. This is an area uh, we're not only working with in ICF or in patient site facilities, but also in our acute care hospitals. This is really a key transition point where if things are done well, um, it, we have more quality outcomes and benefits uh, to the patient and family. So um, effective care transitions really are very important to making sure quality care outcomes uh, uh, happen and are integral in reducing 30-day uh, readmissions. Finally, a warm handoff between the inpatient and outpatient care providers with good assessment data and care plans communicated uh, really go far in ensuring that folks don't have a 30-day readmission or return to the inpatient psychiatric facility within 30 days. Um, here is some background, again, um, an overview about care transitions. Um, and the source of this is um, our behavioral health national consultant with the MCC and CMS. And his name is Dr. Edwin D. Beaudreau, and um, he has some ABCs. I like these ABCs. A, um, for care transitions, it's important to do a thorough assessment of the needs of the patient. B, build a care plan. And C, make sure that warm handoff or the communication of a plan to all relevant parties um, occurs. And that includes two Cs, contacting the patient after discharge, make sure things are uh, going as planned and uh, that there's not any barriers, particularly with this population, uh, social barriers, transportation barriers, um, uh, inability to access. Uh, Post-discharge uh, medications can be a real barrier and promote uh, an unnecessary 30-day readmission. And then also another C is to carry out the transition plan. This is, again, the warm handoff, making sure that transition plan is carried out effectively. I am going to briefly talk about the readmit tool, um, and then I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Linda, um, to talk about um, some diversions um, for admissions or pre-admissions to IPF uh, models that we have found effective at Health Insight in with our providers. But first off, the readmit tool um, is a tool um, that is evidence-based, and it was developed out of Ontario, Canada by um, the good, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing all these names correctly, Cardiac Sites and all, and um, they really created a clinical risk index tool to determine the probability or the risk, it's kind of the risk um, in patients of psychiatric readmission within 30 days of discharge. So this article um, by these authors was published in the Journal of Psychiatric Research in 2015, and I encourage you folks to Google it and look at the whole research article. It's, it's very interesting. And um, they really, in summary, um, use population-based socioeconomic and health data to develop this predictive risk model. This is one of the few um, risk models um, that has been published in the literature, and we hope um, to have some discussion after we present to hear um, some of your ideas and practices about how you predict readmissions and what you do to minimize 30-day readmissions in this vulnerable population. But what um, Vigood, Kurdiak, and Sites found where there's some key factors associated with 30-day readmissions. And these include past readmissions. So, you know, if there's been a history of coming back in or that revolving door, that adds risk. 
emergent emissions. If somebody came in, a patient with harmed self or a threat to others, certain diagnoses are more prone to um, the likelihood of 30-day readmissions, such as a psychotic episode, bipolar, and personality disorders or access to disorders. An unplanned discharge is another risk factor. Um, and medical poor morbidity is also a risk factor. Prior service use intensity, so a high user um, that uh, is associated directly to risk of 30-day readmission. And finally, the time spent in the hospital. So longer the time, the higher the risk. So each one of these points um, in um, this readmit tool that I just described, increase the odds by a 30-day readmission by 11%. And I'm really excited to highlight that Lake Superior, um, thanks to John Glover from LCSW and Ross, Ross Gasky, um, information analysts with Lake Superior have actually developed an electronic scoring tool based on the readmit, and we would be delighted uh, to send that to you. Ross did a very nice job of uh, developing a spreadsheet where you can enter um, the patient information um, at time of submission that goes over um, those risk factors that I just uh, talked about in this slide. And um, these, these variables um, can be then um, calculated um, and turn out into um, kind of a, a rating scale, low, which would be indicated in green, that patients have a readmit score between 0 and 18, medium, which would be indicated in yellow, um, with a readmit score from 19 to 25, and high, which would be indicated in red, um, for patients with a reemit score of 26 and greater. So um, this was just developed. Again, kudos to Lake Superior. Um, I'd like to recognize that they did work um, with uh, the authors of the readmit tool out of Ontario, Canada. And uh, the authors were really pleased to see that Lake Superior had, you know, taken um, this one step further. So we're excited to use um, that electronic tool here with our IPS and the Health Insight Follows region. So in summary, um, the readmit is an evidence-based tool to identify psychiatric patients most at risk for IPF readmission within 30 days. It really is effective on focusing discharge and care management resources in the most efficient manner. In other words, those, post, those patients most at risk um, should have the most attention from case management and discharge planners. And with limited capacity and psychiatric resources available, um, as we all know, that is a, an issue we constantly struggle with um, in behavioral health, the re tool um, ultimately can optimize and target interventions to those patients most vulnerable for readmission. So it can really, you know, help you triage and prioritize. Um, your interventions. So, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Linda here, um, and we're really excited to talk about um, some of our activities on pre-admission and diversion here in Utah, and um, not to um, steal any thunder, but I'm going to just say that from quarter two, 2017, to quarter three, 2017, um, with uh, the Intermountain Healthcare McKay D model, um, we've seen a reduction um, in their inpatient psychiatric facilities of a 12% reduction in that quarter. Um, it's probably hard to say that's all attributed to this model, but it's interesting when we compare that with our other um, IPFs that we've been working with, um, CMS on our behavioral health test, this is a significant reduction. And uh, it, it seems that at least a good part of that would be attributed to this innovative model. 
So, Linda, I'm going to pass it to you, and thank you for telling us about um, this pre-admission diversion model happening in Utah. Thanks so much, Joan. It's a real honor to be here and spotlighting um, some of the work, excellent work that's been done here in Utah. Just to let you know, Intermountain Healthcare is the largest healthcare provider here in the state of Utah with 21 hospitals as part of their um, system. They don't have 21 IPFs, but they do have um, a pretty broad spread. And initially, as I was working with hospitals, because they're looking at all cause readmissions, not just IPF. Um, and then I bring up the issue of what are you doing about your psych patients? What I commonly hear is, well, it's such a small percentage of the overall readmission problem that we're not spending any time on it. Well, I can understand that. You know, resources are limited. But um, there are some specific issues related to behavioral health. When we look at the readmission rate at the McKay-D inpatient site facility, their readmission rate is running um, at the baseline period at 25.2%. Statewide, Utah was running at 19.5. So they're higher than the state average, and certainly there's room for improvement there. When we compare them to everyone else, they are in the bottom third. Uh, or were in the bottom third. Um, so it really seems reasonable that they would want to spend some time and energy on this. Um, the readmissions, as you know, you could predict were primarily around mood disorders, schizophrenia, or other psychiatric disorders. And um, there were a couple with um, substance related disorders. Next slide. Okay, thank you. So as they kind of delved into their data and were identifying what brings a patient with behavioral health needs into the emergency room, and they looked at a number of their readmits and what the process was, and the emergency room is kind of like the stopgap measure in that it's about the only safety net mechanism in healthcare that any comer can come in, get some level of care without having to worry about appointments, um, all of that kind of thing. But if any of you have been in an ER, you know what the atmosphere and ding, um, ding, ding. <laughs> yeah, not good when you're talking about someone with a psychiatric disorder. The EDs are really designed to manage accidents, injuries, severe illness, or trauma that requires immediate care. Even though quite often with these behavioral health patients, they have a need for immediate care, that's not what the EDs are designed for. Um, occasionally, these patients would wind up in the urgent care settings. But really what they were finding was patients who wound up in the ER were patients in crisis and specifically related to the struggles they're having in managing their mental illness. So um, what they have done here is they have developed a behavioral health center that is right across the street from the emergency room. So it's very close, but from there, it's totally different. The way it's designed, the way it's um, supported everything. So the way they set it up is that um, the patients are coming, if they come into the emergency room per se, the initial triage, if they identify that it's primarily a behavioral health issue, they will send them to um, this center across the street. And then um, when they walk into the behavioral health center, there are no hospital beds. It's sofas, chairs, 
a comfortable, quiet environment. Um, there are people there who have expertise in behavioral health. That's their area of focus. They're not required to take off their clothes and put on a hospital gown, as they always are in the emergency room, no matter what. Um, so it was designed to be really an environment that is much more conducive to energy and patients with behavioral health. Um, definitely, when you're talking about patients in crisis, and I'm not telling you anything you guys don't know already, but um, really the type of assessment that you do with a behavioral health patient is really about their history, their um, what has been done in the behavioral health realm, what their um, treatment plan is, where in the emergency room, it's very dedicated toward physiologic issues, doing x-rays, lab tests, et cetera, et cetera. Well, to the best of my knowledge, there's no lab test for behavioral health issues. <laughs> yeah. The nice thing about this being right across the street is they are able to share staff. This is a center that is staffed 24-7. And um, the emergency physicians do cover it in addition to psych psychiatrists. But what they're finding is because it's so close and easy, it's not a struggle or a pain for the emergency room physician to say, come over and do an assessment of this self-injury that we've identified or whatever. And they also have a really intense system of being connected to community providers and options. Again, if you've ever been in an ER, they're focused on, are we going to admit you or are we just going to send you out and good luck? It's kind of that phrase of um, freedom or freedom, you know. So what they have Done, they do an initial triage assessment. If there are no underlying pathophysiology, um, then they are sent over to this center. There is an RN, um, a psychiatrist, and a crisis worker available to these patients, all of whom obviously have some behavioral health back, background. They do a pretty comfort comprehensive review of the immediate patient needs, and sometimes that does mean readmission to the inpatient psych unit. If that's what they need, that's what they're getting. But quite often, they're struggling with some aspect of the follow-up care. They couldn't get in to see a psychiatrist in a timely manner. They're struggling with transportation issues, you know, those kind of things. So. Um, that's where looking at the community resources really helps. Another thing that everyone's always interested in, they bill, bill this to patients as an outpatient um, visit rather than an emergency visit. And as you know, emergency department visits are very expensive. So there is an advantage that way, especially as so many of these patients are self-pay. Next slide. Okay. So what are they finding? They're finding about 50% of behavioral health patients that used to wind up in the traditional ER are now being treated at the center and resulting with a significant decrease of the number of patients with behavioral health issues that are being seen in the ER. They are also looking to expand this model to other hospitals as well because it has been so successful. If you're interested in um, a little more information about this, um, Joan has included the link to the article that was published just a month ago in Modern Healthcare on how they've done this and how they set it up. So I highly recommend that and I think that could be helpful for you. 
One thing I um, am very impressed from a quality improvement standpoint is this is a long-term type solution. This is not something that we're really looking at, well, in the next two weeks, how's that going to happen? There is an investment of time and energy and a commitment to it, but it really has the potential to show a long-term impact on how behavioral health patients are being managed. Thank you, Linda. That was very, very informative. And um, thank you to Intermountain Healthcare. Uh, they are an integrated behavioral health model, have been doing this kind of work for many years now, and have really been a national leader of that. And we're lucky uh, to learn um, from their work in this area. And they've really been a super partner and uh, a good laboratory for testing some of these ideas. So that concludes our formal presentation, and now we are going to move for the next half hour in, um, into our discussion and sharing questions. So, operator, could um, I uh, ask you to open the line so folks can, can uh, chat and share issues and ask questions? And um, also, uh, if you so choose, um, you can add your questions or comments in the chat, and we do have staff that are monitoring that also. So please go ahead and offer open those lines. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions at this time, please press the number one key. Again, if you have any questions at this time, please press the number one key. And I'm waiting for callers to join the queue at this present time. Thank you. And then there questions in queue? Yeah, there you go. I'm sorry? I was saying I don't have anyone on queue on this side. I'll let oh, you know as soon as I see some. Well, let, let, me, um, let me maybe pose some questions. Um, with the folks that are on the line, um, you know, we talked about the bridge model and the red model in our last call. Today we talked about um, the readmit risk stratification tool and um, the really promising results uh, we're looking at um, with Intermountain Healthcare on their uh, pre-admission uh, diversion of site patients to an urgent care clinic across the street. Just curious um, if folks that um, are on the line, um, if you could share or talk with us about um, what models you are using and I'm sure you have your own laboratories, too, and experiences in this. So if you wouldn't mind um, sharing what models are you using, or um, you could also tell us what models um, that you used and that didn't have the promising results, because that's all about the part of the experiment in this area, too. So I'd like to um, have folks uh, begin discussion uh, sharing any Models that were promising or some that had some barriers. And if you would like to do that verbally, um, please press the number one key. We have our first question from uh, uh, Molly Darling. Please go ahead. Hi. So I, I actually, it's, it is more of a question, and that is on the facility that you have that's across from the hospital. Um, do they take involuntary patients from um, law enforcement? That's a really good question, and I'm not sure I know the um, complete answer to that. I'm not intimately involved in the process of what they've done, just more on the um, overall data and that sort of thing. But we can certainly find that out. Um, I do know that sometimes when a patient comes into the ED and is exhibiting some definite behavioral health things, possibly in combination with other um, physiologic abnormalities or whatever, for example, a suicide attempt or um, something of that nature, 
if these folks can, they will go over to the emergency room as well as the emergency room people coming to the center in order to kind of provide that care where it needs to be. The environment is not the same, and so um, obviously there are some limitations to that. But it is a kind of a two-way. If you're needing someone to help immediately and there are obvious physiologic issues that we need to address, they can go over and help with that. So we will um, follow up, um, and um, I will work with uh, the Lakes of Superior staff in getting that answer to the question um, that you posed an excellent, and we will uh, find that answer out and, uh, about the uh, taking involuntary admissions um, from law enforcement and get back with you on that. Thank you. Thank you. Again, ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions, please press the number one key. Are you have any remarks? There's no one in queue on my end. Okay, maybe I'm going to throw out um, some other areas for uh, folks to think about. I'm wondering, uh, with the participants on the phone, um, how they are monitoring their readmissions. Um, we at Health Insight work with our um, IPF um, on reports. That's one of the, the service we provide to them um, about their 30-day readmissions. And um, we show the trends, uh, show the baseline, where they stand up in, uh, against the peers uh, with the other IPFs in the state. And uh, we also um, look in these reports at uh, the most common diagnosis that are contributing to the 30-day readmission rate, and not surprising, uh, we find um, psychosis and mood disorders uh, most, are the most common reasons for 30-day admissions. Another um, thing we monitor in our data reports here are the most frequent or most common days for a 30-day readmission to occur, and we do that for each of our facilities. But in general, um, we find that um, folks, uh, the most common times for folks to come back for readmission is between 7 and 10 days. And so that really um, is, you know, I think an important indicator for uh, targeting appropriate outpatient follow-up and making sure that folks um, are seen within that initial week and a half after discharge because that is the time when folks seem to decompensate and come back into the hospital. The other thing we monitor in our data reports is where that patient's going after uh, discharge from an IPF. Uh, the most common place we see they're going, and you're not going to be surprised by this, is home. Um, and many of these patients don't have support systems, uh, can be socially isolated, and that lack of social support and possibly compounded with transportation issues, uh, financial issues, can really contribute um, to the complications of following through on appropriate outpatient behavioral health therapy. Hey, I have a question there uh, from Shelly uh, who asked, is the, risk, the readmission risk gratification tool, is that adaptable to an, e, uh, uh, an EHR? Can that be put into an EHR? Um, I would believe so. I would believe so. We also and, have a question over the phone, too, whenever you're ready. We're ready. Okay. Go ahead, hello, Kate Logan. Oh, hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Hi. Welcome. This is, this is Ross Gatsky from the Lake Hi, Lake Ross. Twin. Hi. Just to give um, some general, we, there were some questions about the readmit tool in the chat, um, just to let everyone know that um, we do have the tool ready to share with uh, all the participants on this call, and we will probably be looking at getting that tool out along with that, that um, the clinical research study 
Uh, we'll, we'll be looking to get those two pieces out to all participants on the call sometime by next week at the latest, I would think. Um, also, in regards to the question about the uh, the remit stratification tool being implemented in an EHR, the way we created it is we just simply cre uh, created a tool using an Excel spreadsheet. Um, so it's, it's separate from uh, an EHR application. Now, that being said, depending on the uh, features and functionality of an EHR, I would assume it could be um, placed as a customized tool within an EHR, but that all depends on um, what kind of EHR uh, a, an inpatient uh, psych uh, setting has. So um, just to let you guys give you some background on that, it is not technically within an EHR, but it, there is probably the, it has the potential to be put into one. And thank you, uh, Ross, for your excellent work on that. Um, I, I think uh, your work has made this uh, very practical and easy for folks to use. So when that, um, I would recommend when that is uh, sent out by you folks over in Lake Superior to the um, webinar sharing call participants, that they take that Excel spreadsheet um, to their IT people um, that work with their EHR systems to see if that can be um, if, if folks, the clinical staff, want to use that, if that can be added on. Other comments or questions? There are no questions in queue on this end, but if you do have a question or comment, please press the number one key. Hi, this is uh, this is Mark from Lake Superior. Um, just want to comment uh, on uh, intervention. I know this being used in Wayne County in Detroit, um, in the Detroit area, is um, there. It, there used to be a, a sort of a crisis center um, a network where people would go. In fact, I managed one for five years in Western Wayne County um, many years ago, um, where patients would go and they'd be triage treated um, uh, by you know evaluated by psychiatrists and. Uh, social order and then either placed in the hospital or sent to another level of care. But now they're using a program called COPE where in the, if a psychiatric patient shows up in an ED setting, um, they call a, um, a caseworker who will go or a, 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 I'm sure it's a social worker, I'm not sure if they're bachelor's or master's level, a, a, you know, psychologist who go and do an evaluation at the ED for the, uh, for the patient and then look at alternative placement. Uh, options, um, things like crisis residential, um, if, there, if there's a need for that, um, uh, return to home with outpatient follow-up, and that's all coordinated by the person that meets them in the ED. Um, I don't have any data on it. I could actually get some from some folk um, and, uh, from my contacts at Detroit Wayne Community Mental Health, but I know they've had some good luck with that in, in diverting patients um, from readmitting from an ED with with behavioral health with behavioral health disorders, as opposed to sending them to a crisis center where they would possibly wait for several hours, and um, and uh, this way it gets them um, uh, triage pretty quickly and out of the ED, either to another location for um, you know domiciliary IOP, domiciliary partial hospital, crisis residential, or home uh, with with outpatient follow up. So um, it's called uh, COPE. I don't know what the act. To look up with the acronym. Mr. Dan, can you say that again? What's the acronym that you're using for that? It's called the COPE program. C U L P? That's C O P E. Okay. Okay, very interesting. So that there's, it sounds like there's been some uh, uh, experimenting with that with uh, positive results in. Um, Western Wayne County, which includes the uh, Detroit metropolitan area. So thank you for sharing that. Appreciate it. Others would like to share or um, add some questions um, either on the readmit model or on um, any other uh, issues you're struggling with. Um, this is your time. We'd uh, like to um, have folks feel free to uh, bring up issues that uh, you would feel uh, that was more productive with discussion.
One other intervention that um, I can share with you that a number of facilities are exploring here in Utah, and I'm curious if any of you out there who've been doing this, Utah is mostly a rural state. Of course, around Salt Lake City, Ogden, Provo, we call that the Wasatch Front. Um, it's more of an urban metropolitan area. And what we're, we also have found as a state is when we're sending people with behavioral health issues um, back to their rural home setting or wherever it is they're going, the logistics of trying to get the follow-up care can be very challenging. Sometimes it's like three hours away is the nearest social worker, for example. And there's been some testing being done with a telemedicine approach, specifically around behavioral health, where for some of these folks that are in these outlying areas, they make an arrangement, there's a psychiatrist there, they have a little camera on their um, computer, whatever. Um, sometimes the hospitals help with that in terms of if you can get to the hospital, even though they don't have behavioral health, they can link you into the telemedicine. And, you know, to me initially, I was like, well, does that work exactly? especially because so much in behavioral health is around the developing relationship with the therapist and so on. But surprisingly to me anyway, maybe that's just my ignorance, patients have been giving it very high reviews, as have the psychiatrists. They feel like it's much easier to do a better assessment if they have an opportunity to see the patient and kind of observe in addition to hearing what they're saying verbally. So I don't know, are any of you using some type of intervention like that to help with the post-hospital care? Hey, Joan. Um, he's got some more information on the CULT program just to get it, just to put some context into it. So it stands for Community Outreach for Psychiatric Emergencies. Um, and what they have stated in their brochure here is um, it's a professional mobile crisis team that's available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, and they come to emergency departments, group homes, community mental health clinics, public buildings, um, or any other location that an individual crisis might be at. So it sounds really interesting, and um, it looks like the, the individuals that come out and assess these folks are, are those who have experienced, you know, a crisis themselves, have like a history of, um, you know, mental illness um, or, or substance use, so uh, more like a, like a peer support um, coordinator. It's really interesting. So we can send that out to folks. That would be helpful. You're right. That really is a good model. And I know one of our psychiatric hospitals associated with our University of Utah here has a mobile crisis unit that has been very well received in the Salt Lake County area. Um, and uh, they also use peer support. So thank you for bringing that up. That peer support and that model um, is, is a very effective uh, a way um, to treat uh, a crisis situation and to address some of these behavioral health issues um, immediately in the home setting or in the community setting so these folks don't, you know, end up in the emergency room by default. So thank you for sharing. Other issues folks want to discuss or questions, anything in the chat room? Uh, if you would like to say it over the phone, please press the number one key. No callers in queue. Okay. Well, guess what? I'm going to give you a gift of some uh, free time back. 
Thank you so much for uh, joining our call. Um, as promised, we will get um, the information out about the Western Wayne County program and also um, uh, as Ross said, he will be sending uh, the research article on the readmit and also the Excel spreadsheet that he um, and John Glover worked on um, that actually uh, can be utilized to uh, electronically assess the risk. And then we will get back also um, regarding the answer to the question about the involuntary admissions, whether the uh, behavioral health clinic that's adjacent to one of our Intermountain hospitals that has had the effective results if they do um, in fact take uh, involuntary patients from law enforcement. So that's our promised follow-up and um, I want to thank you on behalf of Health Insight and Lake Superior Quinn for uh, joining this call. Um, my uh, last uh, looks like, uh, let's see if I can get that here. Well, um, if, if you uh, want to contact either Linda and I, um, uh, there is contact information on the first page of this uh, uh, presentation, and we would very much enjoy talking to you. So thank you very much, and uh, have a great day, everyone. Thanks for joining. I would also like to say thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining me. I'll disconnect, and have a great day.